On this week's show, what is bridging finance and how and when and why should you use it? In the news, we're going to be discussing the million pound wasteland within the borough of London. And we're going to be answering all your property related questions. Hi, I'm Russell Leeds. I'm Alistair Cunningham. Okay, so this week's show, yes. we're talking about bridging finance. Yeah. A lot of people um, are confused by it, don't understand how it works, yeah. why it works, why do you need it. Uh, well, obviously, it's something that we've both. I, I, have you only? I've only ever used it for a buy refurbish refinance Same, type. Yeah, deal. I've, okay. I would only use it for buy refurbish refinance. Okay, cool. So, do you want to first of all just explain in layman's terms yeah. um, what is a buy refurbish refinance, and then and then, ha- and oh, then we'll talk okay. about how bridging fits into that. Right, a buy refurbish refinance is where you buy a property, mm-hmm. you refurbish it, and you refinance it. It's that simple. It, the, 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 it's in the name. It's kind of the same. We just added in like you. Yeah, in between it is in you the buy, name. you <laughs> you purchase, you add value, you refurbish, and then you refinance it or you flip it, okay. whatever you want so, to do. So, so, basically, so basically, if you if you don't know why would you do that? Okay, well, mm-hmm. how, how does that work? So basically, let's say um, there's a row of houses, each house on the street on average worth 100k. Yeah, there's one of them though, disgusting, absolute yep. mess, Minging. god, yep. uh, uh, right? So it's only worth 50 because nobody wants it. Yeah, going price, right? You buy it for 50. You yep. spend fifteen thousand yep. pounds doing it up, especially if you. I know you got a lot of good contacts. We've yeah. both got a lot of good contacts to do that as cheaply as we possibly yeah. can, which means that overall you've put in sixty five. You uh, you then get the the um, the, the valuer, mm-hmm. uh, the mortgage company. They'll come and have a look at it and they go, ah yes, it, it is worth a hundred. We will give you a mortgage on it yeah. for a hundred. Here is your. Um, 70, you obviously live 25 in 75 grand, you get all your money back out. Yeah, plus so it's just some. a way of plus some. Um, I'll, I'll give you a, a very brief example of a, a deal that I've just done recently. Um, it's fallen through, so it's not going to happen um, because what's happened, okay, it was, I've, I've got an investor that's bought two houses in a street in Liverpool. Did you get gazumped? I got gazumped massively. Oh, right? Massively? Yeah. So I've got an investor that's bought two houses in, in Liverpool. One is was done um, sort of beginning of the year. It's already completed. He's already done the refinance. Now that was refinanced up to 104,000 pounds. 104, yeah? Right. Remember that number. Um, and the other one, he's now in the middle of having the refurb done uh, and that will be getting valued about the same. Both of which he bought for between 65 and 75. Okay, he's put 10, 15,000 into them. He's going to get them refinanced at 105. Okay. So he's going to leave a little bit of money in there, but he's still going to pull a lot out. He's going to have a lot of equity. Yeah. And they've been converted. They've been both been put into three bedroom HMOs. Um, now, I my builder was there doing the work in his, his second house. And over the road, he saw an identical house, estate agents in there showing somebody around. And he went, my builder went over and said, is this for sale? And the guy said, yeah, of course it is. Um, so we went in it. And uh, my builder went in, had a look around. Um, and he said, how much is it on the market for? It was on the market. They were looking for £36,000 for the property because it needed back to brick. It needed everything doing. Um, the boiler had been stolen. It was a, a shell, basically, okay? And it was full of rubbish, okay? So we, we, he rung me up and he goes, Alistair, he goes, got this house, do you want it? And I'm like, yeah. So I rung up and I said, I'll pay thirty-six for it. Um, and they accepted it. It's now... It went through, it was starting to go through. I, I instructed surveyors. Uh, I wasn't even, I instructed a surveyor. But I was going to pay cash for it, but I was going to get it surveyed just in case. Um, and I paid for that and they were coming out to do it. And then the estate agent phoned me up and said they've had a higher offer. So it's now, at the minute, it's now at 55. Um, you were willing to go to 50, weren't you? I was willing to go to 50, no more than 50, because uh, my builder said 25 to 30,000 pounds. Now I know that it's going to get valued about 104. Um, give or take, maybe let's just say a hundred. So if it gets revalued at a hundred thousand pounds, I know that if I can pull seventy five thousand pound back, so if all my costs come in at under seventy five thousand pound, I know we got a seventy five seventy five thousand pound mortgage because you get a seventy five percent loan to value. So a seventy five percent of a hundred thousand is seventy five thousand. So as long as my purchasing costs, all my my refurb costs, my actual purchase, the acquisition, all my costs are less than seventy five, I'll pull all of my money out. And it would be made. It would be made into a three bed HMO. Now at the minute, the the they've got an offer on the table of fifty five thousand. I'm not prepared to go to that because by the time I put twenty five thirty, how much could you get twenty five grand to get? It by done the time twenty five thirty into into it because it does need to go back to brick. Um, it, it, it's full of damp. It, it it needs a top to bottom. Mm. Now my build is very very good, and he he would he said it would be no more than thirty, but. 
every time he's given me a price for a job, whether it be for me or an investor, they've always come in under. So at 55, so you're could, probably leaving 10 grand in Probably leave 10 grand in. And but if you go above that, then it's 15. Yeah. It's like, well, I might as well just buy a different house. But, but buy a different house because I'm not emotionally tied to it. So I'm, I'm waiting and I've, the estate agent knows who I am. They know that, they know that I'm, I've got an offer. Of course they are. They've probably read your book. Maybe, but they know who I am. Not in that sense. They know I. They I know am. you're going to do whatever it takes to get the deal. They know I'm going to do whatever, <laughs> um, as long as it's under fifty thousand pounds, <laughs> right? Um, and when it when it falls through at fifty five, they'll probably come back to me because it probably will fall through at fifty five. So I'm just going to sit and wait. Um, and so that's that's an example of a buy refurbish refinance deal. Okay, so hopefully it kind of makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, the, we could we could go on giving tons and tons of examples mm. of, of how it works. It is brilliant because technically as well, fantastic strategy. You, you, if you, if you, let's say, if you put like 10, uh, 10 pound in, obviously it's a lot more, but 10 pound in, you pull your 10 pound back out again. Even if you only made a hundred quid, yeah, yeah, it's like it's an infinite return. Infinite, infinite return, yeah. isn't it? Well, we run a program on Academy called Infinite Returns, which teaches this which strategy. Teaches this strategy. How you do We've it, how to it. find it, how to cheap load, because it is an infinite return. Hundred percent. So, question then: What we're talking about? Bridging finance. Number one: Why? Why do you need? But why don't you just get a mortgage on? Well, it? The, the best way the best ways to finance these deals is either cash or bridging. So, if you haven't got the full amount in cash, you can use bridging finance. Bridging basically allows you to act as a cash buyer. Mm. It's still finance, but it's in, in this, it's essentially cash. Um, however, it does come with a lot of fees. Uh, so you have to be very careful and be very understanding of what them fees are before you commit. Um, now, basically, bridging is a short-term, high-interest loan to let you facilitate acting as a cash buyer. Because basically, you, when you, you go from buying <laughs> it, you're not going to get a mortgage on it nope. until you've done the work. Well, you wouldn't want to because it's not the best way to do it. No, so, but what I'm saying is, so, so you got you buy it at day, at day A. Yeah, either on cash yeah. or bridging. Yeah, then it takes, say, three months, yeah. six months, however long it takes to do yeah. refurb, then you get your mortgage. Yes. So there's a gap there. Yeah. So the bridging finance, it just bridges, bridges that the gap. gap. We lend you the money for that gap yeah. from buy to, um, to, to when you're going to yeah. get the mortgage. Now, a lot of people get put off bridging, and I've, I've already said it, high interest. Mm. It is high interest. It's very high interest. But if you compare that to you buying it cash and losing that money out of your bank, as long as all the numbers still tally up at the end, it's still very useful, but you've got to use it correctly and wisely. Don't rush into a bridging deal because you're like, you you, you want the deal so badly. Make sure the numbers stack, make sure it all works properly. It's um, interesting though, isn't it? Because like with mortgages, the rates are kind of very, well, obviously you can get fixed rates, but the rates are kind of similar. Yeah. With bridging, the rates are... Ma- like literally from six percent to eighteen percent. You'll you know. typically pay on bridging between zero point eight, and I've seen as high as three percent per month for the amount of money you want to borrow. I've never had it that high. I've, for me, it's always been between the six and eighteen. Yeah, over the, year, over the year, over the year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm talking yeah, about not monthly. a month. Not I'm a talking month. about monthly. Yeah, but three percent a month is like thirty-six percent a year. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Like, I've never so, had it that hard. Um, but, but there is out there, trust me. Um, now, bridging... Forget property investing, I'm going to go into bridging. Yeah, well, <laughs> true. Um, it's 36%. When you think about it, when you think about it, right, if you're buying a deal and it's going to take you three months, right, I would always get the bridge over a longer period of time. Pay it maybe over six months, or, or if your deal's going to take six months to complete, nine months, I don't know. Always have, have a buffer there, three or four months buffer. Buffer. Because the fees, as long as you know the fees up front, you can calculate and you work them into your figures. But where bridging gets expensive is where you run over. And you, you've got a six-month bridge, but you run over to seven months because the interest rate goes up and the fees Not go up. Not necessarily. A lot of them do. I, I ran over okay. and they just extended it on the same deal. Okay, that's good. Um, that's good, um, but some of them don't. But that's where bridging does. But then you were there. You were there, mercy. Yeah, because they. Do you know what I love about bridging? I love about bridging is the bridges don't really care so much about you. It's more about the property. Mm. Now, the, the the three main things that you you cannot be: you can't be bankrupt, you can't be in current mortgage mortgage arrears, and you can't have any CCJs. So you can't have them. If you, as long as you've got them, there's a high probability you'll get bridging, whereas you might not get a mortgage. Yeah, because they very credit. they very much look at the house. Yeah. So they were, they want to look. I remember when we did um, Ribsford House. Yeah. We got we got bridging finance for that. 
And they were very much, there was like, yeah, we don't care about you. Let's go. They wanted to go around mm-hmm. and do surveys. And they wanted to do, but do you know the great thing about know, Britain? Like you know what I'm going to say? Go, you the great I'll, let you, thing. I'll let you do it, though. Go on, okay. Thank you. I appreciate you. You're I such know what a you're great gonna do, guy. Though. The great thing about bridging is they assess the deal for you. Bang on. Yeah. Right. So when we did the castle, um, having the bridging company prepared <coughs> to do it gave me a lot of extra because co- it's such for us it was such a big project. Yes. Right. 100%. We're doing a lot more like that now. We've got yeah. quite a few that are a similar kind of level, but it was such a big project compared to what we've done before um, that it was a little bit scary. Yeah. And and, and, and for. For most people watching this, maybe just doing a buy refurbish finance it, in the first place is scary, will yeah. be scary, yeah. um, let alone in the millions. Um, but having a bridging company that will go and have a look at it and go, okay, yeah, that makes sense. No, that all stacks that because they're not going to lend you the money if they don't think they're going to get the money back. No, because you got to understand they've got first charge. Yeah, they've got first charge on the property. So if if the property doesn't stack up as a viable investment, they're not going to lend you the money. No, it's that simple. And they force you to because have an exit strategy yeah. and what you're going to do. And it's going to be you're going to give them the house, so you know you know you're going to lose it. Bridging's great if done properly, um, but just be aware that there is some pitfalls to be aware of. Be aware of the risks. Be aware of the finance, the length of time, the length of time, the the costs, the fees. And you only got like an entrance fee, an yeah. exit fee, and this fee, and also, that fee. I said earlier, bridging is not really about the person, it's about the property. However, if you plan to bridge and then put it onto a buy-to-let, you still need need to be able to get a buy-to-let mortgage. Of course. Well, you can but actually yeah, get... Yeah, but I just want to clarify that because some people think bridge, you guarantee the mortgage, you're not. Um, however, there is companies such as Precise Mortgages, Shawbrook, Shawbrooks, um, they'll do a bridge to buy-to-let. So you, you set it all up in the beginning and they set the buy-to-let up for you at the beginning. Which is perfect. Um, which is brilliant. So you've already got your exit. Your exit is buy on bridge, do the refurbishment, get it revalued, go into a buy-to-let. And it's generally all done with the same company. Uh, it's amazing. But yeah. you need to speak to a proper broker, a decent broker who really understands bridging because you don't have to be the expert at this. You just have to know who is. Mm. So you have to go and speak to the right person. I'm not the expert on bridging. I don't really know all the, the breakdown of fees. I don't know that. All, all I need to know is how much is it going to cost me to bridge this property? What's my money in? What's my money out? That's yeah. all I need to know. Yeah. I don't need to know the there's a £75 arrangement fee, there's a £900 ex. I don't need to know that. I don't care about that. All I care about is when, my, when I talk to my broker, what are my costs? Yeah. If he says it's £2,800, I'm like, fine, I can deal with that. But I said the same question. It's funny. I said the same question. They're going through the costs. I'm like, I don't care. What's the, o- for the borrowing the money for that period of time, what's the overall cost? Okay, thank you. Yeah. And for borrowing the money for that for that one, that <laughs> deal, what's the overall cost? Okay. I'll go for the cheaper one, please. Yeah, that's yeah, exactly yeah. it. Yeah. Um, but you, I see so many people on Facebook, they're so worried about all the, the nitty gritty of this, that, oh yeah, you don't do it if you don't know this. You don't need to. All you mm. need to know is you have a good broker who's accredited and registered and with the FCA and who's proper accredited. They're going to give you proper advice. Know your cost. Your broker will tell you that beforehand. And don't run over. Do you know the other great thing? You can get the money very, very fast. Yes. Well. Yeah. What's the fastest you've known? Um, days. Four or five days. The fastest I've ever done personally is 10 days. Yeah. We got I know someone done it in four days where they bought a property at auction. Um, auction for me. Yeah. And they bought a property at auction. They had to get it sorted really quickly. Mm. Um, it wasn't for, I mean, it was like for 89, 80, 80 odd thousand. It wasn't a massive, a massive sum. Now, the thing is with bridging finance, right? Some bridgers will lend you 100% of the money, depending on the property up, up Oh, left. we forgot to mention. You, you, you finished. Yeah, yeah, the uplift. The, the refurb. So the lending- And they'll give you development if the property's over a certain value. So when they check it, they'll, yeah, they'll give you the money. So it's normally, you normally have to put a fair bit of money in yourself, don't you? Well, it depends. It depends. It, it all depends. It comes back to this. It all depends on the property. But for example, yeah. you might have to put 40% yeah. Deposit. So let's say let's say you're uh, no, no let's not use that. Let's say you bought a ha- you bought it for a hundred grand. Yeah. You might have to put like forty percent in yourself. Yeah. Forty grand. But then they would give you the sixty grand for the house yeah. and a hundred percent of the of the development funds. Yeah. So let's just say, look, typically, right, let's just say the house a, a bridger will typically lend you no more than sixty percent loan to value. Now there is some out there that will do more, so I don't want loads of messages saying, you know, this person does this. Typically, okay, sixty yeah. percent loan to value. Um Let's just say you're buying a house that's worth two hundred thousand pounds, but you're paying. You've managed to negotiate it for a hundred thousand pounds. That's fifty percent BMV. I know bridges in that case would finance hundred percent of the purchase price, because the pro- they're probably still worth two hundred. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So you can get a hundred percent bridge, but it all depends on the property. All depends on the deal you're getting. 
Um, but you need to find a really good broker that can do this and really understands it and has fair prices. And if you fees. get a good deal and go to a good broker, they will fix out the middle. Which you just yeah. need to understand the basics, how it works, why it works, yes. what sort of deal you're looking for and, and yeah. all that sort of stuff. Brilliant. But bridging, bridging's amazing. Uh, use it correctly, use it wise, then you shouldn't have any problems. So you're looking for horrible houses that are boarded up and talking about that mm. on the news this week. Things into the news. It's now time for the news. <laughs> In the news this week, we are going to be discussing the million pound wasteland within the boundary of the M25. Wow, you said that in one go. That was impressive. It was. Um, right, so we are going to be talking, taking you inside the crumbling 350 million pound mansions left abandoned on London's billionaire's row. Um, so this place is, 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 is Bishop's Avenue. So Bishop's Avenue, back end of Hampstead Heath. Uh, Bishop's Avenue 1, Bishop's Avenue 2. Now, when I, I used to go to school in London, and I used to now and again go down that road in, in the bus, they used to take me to school, and you would go down there, beautiful big mansions, like you're talking nothing on that street is less than five, ten million pounds. It's it's big bucks. And it's known as billionaire's row. Um, and you're talking huge, huge mansions. I'm sure if you're in London, you know what I'm talking about. It's known as the wealthiest street in London. Um but I drove down there a couple of weeks ago and I also drove down there this morning and I was shocked. The houses, the, there's, some still, there's still some beauties there, but there's so many houses boarded up, wrecked, been left abandoned and just literally got security, full-time security guards, all the outskirts are boarded up, the, the gates are falling down, it's overgrown. Crazy, In one of the houses, there's two cars out the front that have got sheets over top and they look like like sort of 1990s sort of sports cars like um, Ferraris and things like that. They're just, bo- they're just left there, abandoned. And it is honestly, it's like maybe we can get some pictures put up, but I'll just Google it, um, Bishop's Avenue, and you look at the dilapidated houses, but you're talking houses, like I've showed you the pictures of yeah, the, yeah, the, crazy. the staircases, the swimming pools that are just full of rubbish. Could, we, buy one? could we do a, could we do a bridging finance think, and do a buyer refurbishing finance? Do you know, I was down there this morning, I've taken some phone numbers of because it's got four, like handwritten for sale signs outside. Right. Uh, Seriously, I'm I'm, I'm going to start looking into some of these. Could someone have just read that for a laugh? Maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe. But um, there is somehow, honestly, it's amazing down there. But it is a little bit of a shame because think of the what's state. It gonna be, like, what, what's it going to be worth? In that, I bet, mind you, you, you need some serious money. Oh yeah, you ain't going to do this on a on a, uh, a shoestring. Um, but I looked into it a little bit when when I drove down down there like three four weeks ago. I was in, I was shocked. Like I went home and I jumped on Google and I spent like two, three hours just researching and like the, the properties and what's happened. Um, and, and essentially, Bishop's Avenue is owned 50%, like 50% of Bishop's Avenue is owned by Saudi Arabia. Like the Royal, the Saudi Royals, people like that. So, because um, they literally, actually, you know, it's funny because we, we were talking about a, a little bit about this sort of stuff last week mm. on the, on the, on the politician show because there are quite a lot of empty houses. Obviously, Bishop's Avenue is a good example, but in London, in yeah. general, in very nice areas. Yeah. And the reason is, like you say, people from abroad, they'll, they'll buy the property yeah. and then just leave it. Well, one of the houses I found was bought, so we're in, we're in 2019, it was bought in 1998 um, by some Saudi prince and it's been unoccupied ever since. Bought it in 1998, put full-time security guards there and it's been unoccupied ever since. It, and it's just it's just dilapidated. Would, the worst would, thing you can do to his house is leave a house is leave it empty. Wouldn't he be better to just rent it out? Well, like yeah, he's he not do any of the work. He no. doesn't care if there's voids and so <clears throat> just. Thing is, if they've got that much money, they don't care. Like he, he paid twenty three million for it in nineteen ninety eight. I remember the figures paid twenty three yeah, million. Got, for but it. although he's got that much money, unless you got, you don't keep your money by being an absolute moron, do you? So maybe this guy did. But, but I don't know what. Imagine what it's worth now. I don't know what would that probably be. I mean, like, I'm going to look into it, um, but see what it's probably worth. more than 23 million. Yeah, probably yeah, but it may be worth a lot more. But if, if it's he, done up, if it was done up, it'd be worth massively more. Massively more. And now he's got to spend money doing it up again it, if he wants to sell honestly, it. Honestly, the the building is atrocious. It, it just doesn't make any sense. <clears throat> like just, the front garden is like it's like it's like a jungle. Like you got it's all block paved, but it's like there's so much weed and shrubbery coming out. I, I don't think they should be allowed. <clears throat> I don't think it should be allowed. I, 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 I actually agree. Uh, it's funny because I'm now looking looking at it from a slightly different yeah point of view, but it just is ruining like lovely areas in London. I would be pissed if, if you were I a neighbor. owned if I was a neighbor because literally it's get right, squatters, I don't know, probably not all sorts, but um. 
one but of these one of these houses, rather than paying security, pay a letting agent. Yeah, I mean, security is going to be twenty grand a year, isn't it? At least thirty grand a year, probably more. What well, we more more <laughs> more really? Yeah. Well, if you think about it, right. Like you imagine being being a tenant or being an owner of one of them big houses. Did you right? say twenty four seven security. Twenty four seven security. It'll be more. It'll Man be a security. Lot. They've got a little a security lot. hut. They've put us a, a little hut up there. Are they so doing they, more than one house or just one I don't house? Know. I don't know. It's crazy. Um, but my my point being is, if you live there and then either side of your three hundred million pound mansion is two derelict mansions, what's mm. that doing for your house price? It can't be good, can it? It's not good for the road. It's not good for the country. If you ever get a chance to go down there, go down there. Next time we go out on, our, on one of our road trips, I'll take you down there. You'll be shocked. Yeah. Maybe we'll buy one. I don't know. Let's look into it. Well, the thing is, he won't. He doesn't care about the money, though, does he? So he won't be interested, no. annoyingly. Yeah, annoying. Yeah. Annoyingly. But um, it's a baffle, it defies logic. But maybe, maybe... I just can't there is like, also a lot of redevelopment going on down there. So a lot of them are getting... Like, some of them are getting developed. Oh, that's good. Um, but there's, there's still... I would say there's there's about sixty homes on on Bishop's Avenue. I would say twenty of them are boarded up. You should petition for like you to buy one. Yeah, you should buy one. Yeah, I'll buy one. Yeah, we'll buy one. Oh, we'll buy one. on that note, on that bombshell, it's time for the questions. Um, hey guys, what's a good ROI for investors down south, or what's the minimum it would be acceptable? Do you think? I find it hard. Properties above twenty percent down here. Can potential capital appreciation sway the investor's decision? If so, fifteen, seventeen percent ROI. Never stop making podcasts. Oh, we'll Amazing. Every week. Uh, I'll take that. Um, right. Okay. I have investors from all over the world that want properties all over the UK. I have some investors that only want in the south. I have some investors that only want in the north. It depends what your investor is looking for. Um, I've got an investor, for instance, that um, return on investment in the south. He's happy with ten percent. Because when you factor in cash flow, uh, sorry, when you factor cash flow with capital appreciation, he probably is over 20%. Mm. Um, so he's happy with that. 10%. All he wants is 10% minimum. Uh, maximum. He, he's do, Not, do not maximum, know, but he, he would take you know a what? 10% deal, no problem. Do you know what? It very much depends on the deal, doesn't it? Yeah. It's so it depends, like, if you want to do, if you just want to buy to let, a lot of people, so even, even like, I have just some buy to lets, actually. Do you know what I'm seeing, actually? Because it's just um, so easy. Uh, yeah. Do you know what I'm seeing amongst the whole industry? What? Is people have gone, okay, so they've, they've all went buy to let, single lets, 40,000, 50,000 pound, rent 400 pound a month, yeah? Then they all went creative and they went to HMOs. And then they went to service accommodations. Now they're all going, I'm seeing so many people going back to just basic buy-to-lets. So many seasoned investors are going back to just buy-to-lets. Because they've got more money, it's just easier. Commercial. Commercial. Yeah. If, you, if you've got like, if you've got 10, 15% on yeah. a commercial, I'd be like, take it. Take it. Every day of the week. Because then the, the tenants look after everything, the, you don't have to worry. <laughs> In the South, I have investors that will be happy with a 10% deal as long as the, as long as the capital appreciations are. So there you go. Just literally... What do your investors want? Yeah, that's it. If you get to know your investors, hundred um, percent. Do you f- a similar kind of question actually? Do you feel high- Brad, from Brad Hart? Hey Brad, do you feel high returns are harder to come by nowadays? I feel so, but yet me and my father come across more BRRs due to the surge in house prices. It's a good point actually because mm-hmm. BRRs, the return on investment, is often like infinite. A lot, yeah, or, very high, or certainly thousands. Yeah, really so. So can rent to rent. So, no, I don't think they are harder. Actually, do you? I don't think they're harder. I think um, I think there's there's I think think okay. Let, let's look at buy refurbish refinance. I think securing a buy refurbish refinance is getting difficult now because you've got so much competition of people trying to do them. And um, so you're you're constantly getting gazumped and things like that. But I do think the return on investments are are very very good. Very good. Um, uh, do you, do you, Matt Matt Gooley? Yeah, he's Gooley. Matt, Goulies. Just just Gooley. Oh, Gooley. If there's two, if him and his brother are the Gooleys. No, the Gooleys, yeah. Uh, do you feel that the laws around deal sourcing should be made stricter? It seems to be more and more people springing up claiming to be sourcers, but once you start asking questions, it's quite apparent they don't have a clue and are blagging it. Yeah, um, look, the, 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 ro- the rules are pretty strict anyway. Um, it's just a lot of people aren't complying, so... But it doesn't matter how strict you make the rules, you're always going to have cowboys that don't comply. Mm. Um, so I, I agree. Just as someone that's buying deals, you just need to 
just make just sure that they are. You, as, as an investor, you need to, you obviously are doing it because you're asking the right questions. So I, as an investor, you need to make sure that they are compliant and they do know what they're talking about. But yes, there is a lot of people popping up who have maybe watched a YouTube video, they, they've bought a book or whatever, and they're just going out and they're doing deal sourcing. They're not getting properly trained, they're not getting properly educated, and they're not doing it correctly. Mm. Um, just be aware. Um, so I, I get messages daily about this. People saying, oh, look, um, because I, I don't source certain types of deals. So people say, no, I'm going to, uh, like I had somebody message me last night, say I'm about to um, invest uh, £8,000 for a finder's fee for this deal. What do you think? Uh, and I said I wouldn't touch that company with a barge pole because literally I spent two minutes doing my due diligence and I found out a lot of information about that company that I just wouldn't do business with them. Now, my point, what I'm trying to get at is this guy hadn't spent any time doing his due diligence on, just looked at the, on deal. the company. All he done was he looked at the deal. And I spent two minutes, literally probably 20, 120 seconds, and I, I put the name in and I, I literally spent... 120 seconds and I, I went on to company's house and I found out all the information I needed to find out mm. and then binned them off and I'm like dude do not give them a penny of your money uh, do your due diligence that's all you've got to do Deborah Haysmith um, amazing lady uh, how often should one remortgage to release monies and what is the best way to release money in a property please uh, remortgaging if it, I'm assuming you mean buy to let not residential um, so I'll, I'll go with that I would remortgage whenever if you've got an opportunity to do a deal I wouldn't just do it willy nilly um, I would do that I would do it only when you need to do it but plan ahead because obviously a remortgage can take 12 weeks sometimes a bit longer um, so plan ahead so if you've got a deal coming up in 3-4 months start thinking about that now I would oh, um, what I do is every now and again every couple of years I just, I just check the properties see yeah. if they've gone up and I'm like okay probably not worth it uh, so that's a, that, that, that's a good point. So maybe every two years, have a a check a check up on your portfolio and say, look, what equity have I have increased by? And if you've got like a hundred grand, maybe a hundred and twenty grand equity kicking around, and you want to buy another house, then do a remortgage. But I wouldn't just do it to bring out five grand and six grand, seven no. grand. It's just not worth it. And and the best way to do it is just to go to a good mortgage broker and say, I want to remortgage this house, and they'll just get the detail they'll just yeah. tell you what to do but you just follow the process and just go through it and also what are the pros and cons of being a limited company would you recommend to a small time investor we've actually done a video all about this if we could drop a, um, a link to that Adam that would be great right now going through the pros and cons of being a limited company overall if you're planning on being a property investor yeah. and buying properties then it, it overall it works. In my opinion, it is good. If you look at the video that we've done, it really breaks it down because you know, it's not a question I can answer. It's, it's, it's not a two-minute answer. a lot of variables, but the, watch the video. The, we'll put a link to The video is really now. good. Um, I would just... It does very much depend on your personal tax affairs. Mm. Um, so you need to speak to a proper accountant about it. But as a... For us, we're property investors. We're, we're trying to buy lots of deals and we're trying to do lots. For us, it makes sense to be limited. Yeah. Uh, for you, that might be different. But again, I'd speak to an accountant and get, get proper ta uh, tax advice. Hopefully you found that helpful. Guys, thank you ever so much for tuning in. We really do appreciate it. We'll be back next Saturday at 7 p.m. Please do tune in. Don't forget to hit subscribe, share with all your friends. Tell everyone, the tell the world about what tell Alistair the and we tell everyone about us. Thank you very much. We'll see you. I'm just babbling now. We'll see you next week. Is that even a word? Babbling? Babbling. Can babbling. I do this? Can I do this? Guys, see you next week. See you next week. <laughs>